This Week in Virology, the podcast about viruses, the kind that make you sick. This Week in Virology, episode number 205, recorded on October 23rd, 2012. Hi, everyone. I'm Vincent Racaniello, and you're listening to TWIV the podcast all about viruses. This episode of TWIV is sponsored by ASM, the American Society for Microbiology, the world's largest membership society for microbiologists. Find out how ASM membership can help advance your science, your career, and your network. Go to asm.org slash advance. Today, you have just me and a special guest on TWIV. He's a member of the Fred Hutchinson Cancer Research Center and a Howard Hughes Medical Institute Early Career Scientist. It's someone you'll recognize from another episode of TWIV, Harmit Malik. Welcome back. Great, great to be here. Harmit's here in town to give a seminar at Columbia. That'll be tomorrow, and I roped him into a TWIV. So thanks for doing that. I really appreciate it. It's my pleasure. It. Good to see you again. We saw you in um, New Orleans. That's remember? correct, remember? yes, at the ASM meeting. And we had a lot of people on that panel, including Roger Hendricks and Rachel Katzen-Ellenbogen. That's correct. Somebody else, or was that it? I think that was it, four of us, yeah. But today we have just you. We're going to focus totally on you. So, you know, you you factor significantly in TWIV. We had quite a few episodes about that derived from your lab, right? So we did the Pox Accordion paper, which was done in your Just lab, a few right? weeks ago, yeah. yes. By that's Nels right. Eld, right? Yes, that's right. Who was a postdoc with you. Yes, he's now off on his own at the University of Utah. And then we did, uh, we had one of your postdocs, Matt Doherty. That's right. Mike Doherty. Uh, I think this was the postdoc panel yeah. interview that yeah. you did at ASV. We did it that's at great. ASV. So I asked for some volunteers, and he, he volunteered immediately. He's really great. He's really, very thoughtful. I think there was yeah. someone else from your lab. Sarah Sawyer was on the a big ASV podcast. Ah, that's right. Uh, she was podcast. on the ASV yeah. thing. That's Although right. Although she's been gone for six years, I still take all the credit for her, <laughs> but it's probably time to stop. <laughs> that's good. I'm sure she wouldn't mind. I told her you were going to be um, on it. She said she would listen to that one. <laughs> so you have to impress her in some way. So we've had a lot of... Uh, of your lab, but still, we could probably have you on every time because I'm a big fan of your work, and uh, Thank I you. think it's really interesting. And you know, by the way, I recognize the accordion paper because you, when I visited you, what was it 2011? That's right. I told you about the, you the, the big story. names of the story. That's right. Yeah. So that was February 2011. It seemed complete at the time, and here the paper just came out a few months ago. Well, uh, <laughs> it, it was, uh, if you recall, there was one critical experiment, as is always the case, which was that we had to show that genetically nothing else had happened in the pox virus. And so we needed to passage it in hamster cells to see the accordion collapse. And that was the experiment that took us some time to set okay. up correctly. Yeah. Uh, and then, of course, we were uh, in review for a, for a little while. So yeah. it was, but that uh, experiment was not asked for by reviewers, right? No, this was an experiment I wanted to do wanted to, because it, yeah. It, yeah, would, yeah, sure. it would be uh, premature to call it an accordion unless we could right. see the collapse. So, you know, there's this now there's this trend that reviewers always ask you to do a lot of experiments, right? So now there's a trend to cut that out. So this this uh, journal Mbio tries to not ask you to do any more experiments. I think I think that's fantastic because the best scientists they really won't wait for that. They will yeah. put everything in there. So uh, in our paper when it finally went out to review, there were no new experiments asked at all, mm. which is unusual for great. Uh, for cell that's to, great. to do that. So well, you should judge it the way it is, right? That's exactly if right. If you yeah. think it's incomplete, then you reject it. Exactly. But it would yeah. probably do you think it would be worthwhile to tell? Uh, the authors, why you're rejecting it because it's missing this and this and this? Well, I think what I prefer is saying that you're claiming this for yeah. that. We feel you need to provide this yeah, experiment yeah. like as a one-time <laughs> rather than reject it. Uh, but I do agree with the idea that we should not we should review what's in front rather than the paper we wish this would be because that's a completely different story. So Arturo Casadevald, you know yes. him? He's a big fan and he, he gives a great talk where he talks about the uh, the reviewers writing his papers for him, and he really objects to that. He says, you should review it 
what you have there and just make minor suggestions. There was a very nice piece by Hide Plu. You probably saw the ending the tyranny of reviewer yes. experiments. Yes. You, sort of, I, I think there's been a little bit of, a, I think, this groundswell of support for the idea that we should review what's in front and just judge whether the claim that is being made can be made based on the experiments provided. Sure. Yeah. Uh, and I think that's a good trend. I think it's not only important to do that, but as times get tougher and you need to publish uh, to survive, it probably helps everyone in the long run, right? Get your exactly, yes. The the Even worse than actually not reviewing the paper in front of you is, I feel, the trend of changing the yardsticks, which happens mm -hmm. often. It's happened to us a couple of times where there were a lot of experiments asked for and people spend three to four months getting those experiments yes. done. And then... This either went to the same reviewer or to new reviewers, and suddenly there were a whole new series of yeah, experiments yeah. being asked for, and that I think is just completely unfair. I mean, that I've I've seen that happen in the big journal papers. You know? That's right. Yeah, uh, we we did a paper, a Nature paper, some time ago that was so dense. I mean, you could tell that a lot of experiments were. Added it's literally like the suitcase that's been crowned full, the kid, and then yeah. there's the supplementary data, it's which is. And you then the writing becomes so terse that you really can't follow it. Exactly. Because they have to shove so much in there. I, I think that's unfortunate, you know. In the old days, you could just tell a story and then add to it as you went on, right? There's exactly. There's nothing wrong with that. You yeah. don't have to answer every question initially. I think you have to leave it up to investigators to say, this is what I think a story is. You take it or leave it, right? But, you know, like everything else, it's a, it's a business decision often, right? In the big journals, I think it is. Yeah. I think it doesn't have to be for the community journals, where I think no, some no, of the no. best science gets published anyway. So I think ASM journals, which I have the most familiarity with, are like that. You get reviewed, usually. You know, There's no pre-screening, which happens in some of these others. And then uh, you usually get a fair review, although I'm sure a lot of people will disagree with me. But I've always been partial to those because they're nonprofit. There's no urgency to publish to keep your business going, right? Plus, I mean, you don't get the uh, standard that we feel this is more suited for a specialized journal. I mean, how much more specialized can you get than the Journal of Virology? You know, uh, so. Yeah, that's one of my pet peeves. Yeah, it's, a, uh, it's good for a special. I think that's just an excuse that they can't think of any other reason. If you know what, uh, if they don't, if they think it's boring, they should just say it. We think this is boring, and we don't want it because then they'll, then people will get mad, right? But that's basically. What but it's often saying. a subjective decision, and yeah, that's exactly yeah. yeah but they're. There was another aspect of publishing. Um, oh, so then there's the idea that you send a paper in and they say, this is not interesting. We don't want to review it. And the people who are usually doing that are not people who are working every day and would have an intimate knowledge, right? They just they know science because they've worked in the field. But I, I think that's not fair. Yes, it's a little bit hard to digest too. I mean, so for instance, uh, we were very pleased that we actually ended up uh, with the accordion paper, but we did sort of send it to a pre-submission mm -hmm. inquiries and they were extremely rapid, which we appreciated, but yeah. they were like, we don't want this because this method of adaptation has been seen before. And I said, well, it's been seen before in E. coli. And you don't think it's <laughs> remarkable that a virus is doing the same mode of... And it was a little bit because it's, again, a subjective decision, yeah, but it is yeah. something that... Uh, I feel like every author would feel peeved about it and, and yeah, probably sure. justifiably. Uh, but it is a business decision. They're also not not only looking at your paper, but putting into context with other perhaps virology papers mm. that they have, you know, in their hopper. And so it's it's a decision that you can either live with or just move on, but which is what to, we decided. You have to move on. Yeah. But that is an interesting aspect. So they say... You know, this has been seen already, but it's not true But because they don't know the field well enough and they can't appreciate what it would contribute to virology, right? And that's where the people making this... That's why you have to have scientists making those decisions. Yeah, so, sometimes I think sometimes it's also a really quick look. You send an abstract. I mean, yeah, I've, I've yeah, gotten yeah. an abstract. I'm like, I need to see the whole paper because I know how much work goes into these things and mm -hmm, I mm -hmm. don't want to make a quick decision. And occasionally you'll see the full paper and then you'll say, you know, this is the reason yeah, yeah, why we should yeah, review yeah. it. But I also think that time is so limiting for scientists that they get asked and they look at the abstract you make a decision and you sort of move on and yeah it's difficult yeah, yeah. to do that yeah i think it's tough uh 
I think that uh, you have to, I think a really good paper, you should review it. And, and the, the whole model has is, is, is got problems, as you know, and I don't know where it's going to end up. But I, I do like the PLOS model where you have scientists get the papers and then they decide. But even that can have problems, you know. Well, I mean, ultimately, they're, all of these journals are, if, whether they agree to or not, they're interested in making it seem as if their journal is publishing the best papers yeah, sure. in the business. And that quality of what is the best paper is often not quantifiable, except sure. everybody tries to quantify it, and there's impact yeah. factors, etc. And I mean, some of the best papers in virology and even in evolution, another field that I work in, they don't actually have that many citations. And mm -hmm. one of the reasons they don't have that many citations is because this was the definitive paper. There was no need to revisit the study. Yeah. And, yeah, yeah, yeah. and so and this happens in genetics as well. So genetics is a good example. And so it's the community journal publishes the best papers in genetics, but mm -hmm. its impact factor is not on par with even other journals in genetics. And so there's been a move away from publishing in Journal of Virology and Genetics because uh, especially in uh, European countries, impact factor can play a very important role in promotion and tenure decisions. Yeah, that's what and I, I think yeah. this thing has gotten a little bit of its own life in terms of how these uh, decisions are made. Yeah. So have you heard of the um, the archive publishing model? I have, yes. So population genetics is actually uh -huh. doing a lot more in terms of archive publishing, mm -hmm. which I think is a very healthy sign because it actually allows for vigorous debate, yeah. which is not anonymous, uh, which is actually perhaps a, a better model because you can actually have strong opinions about why this paper is correct or incorrect. Yeah. But I think having a dis it's almost like we used to go up after talks at Cold Spring Harbor and tell people, I don't believe that and here's why. And that's actually a very healthy debate to have in science. I, f I feel that right now we're having this debate, but it's one-sided yeah, yeah, and it's yeah. sort of, you're not really having a debate. People are judging your paper and yeah, their yeah. biases can come into the question. So so last week on TWIV, I picked, my pick of the week was a, um, a blog post saying that biology on archive is starting to heat up. They're getting more submissions, and um, and Alan Dove said that that's going to be problematic because biology is a big publishing area, and the journals are not going to want their the papers to be there first. So he thought that they would probably start objecting if a lot of biology went there and then say got submitted to Nature or Cell. I think that could happen. Uh, some journals like Genetics have actually come out in f favor of this model, mm -hmm. so where population genetics papers that have been previously yeah. sent to archive would not be excluded from right. uh, the prior publication. I mean, people have Nature itself, for instance, had its own preprint server where right. it said, but right. you could argue that you know if you then send that paper to Science, let's say they might object to the fact yeah, that it's on. Sure. You know, so it's yeah. a little bit of a slippery slope. I do feel though that. Mm the paper will end up being a better paper because it's been discussed and debated among experts who are interested in looking yeah, at it. And yeah. um, it's like having a worldwide lab meeting, which is basically, or a journal club yeah, discussing yeah. that paper. And so... So a, Google tried to start a similar uh, effort with Noel. That's remember? right, with, with the influenza papers. Yeah. and I, don't, I think it... Has it still alive i, I haven't i think it requires it. a lot of sustained action i think yeah. it was great in the when swine flu was there was a lot of uh, mm. furious activity when right, swine flu right. was detected and there were papers coming literally every day and this was a great place to actually uh, submit those papers as i recall though those papers actually were synthesized into really powerful nature papers mm. at the end and that mm. was not deemed as if it was previously published, even though much of it yeah, was actually yeah. previously published. No, I have a, I have a null paper, and it never got anywhere else. <laughs> it was a flu paper the same year, and was done with some uh, bioinformatics people here, Raul Rabadan, and um, it was dealing with a little open reading frame that had been discovered, and so and he could never get it published anywhere else. So it lives on null, <laughs> my one contribution. But I'm thinking of sending a paper to archive. You know, I'm going to send a JV paper out in a week or so. I'm thinking of putting it on archive. But I don't want to jeopardize the people who are on it, you know. My, it might not be a bad it. idea to send a letter to the journal yeah. itself, you yeah, know, because ASM good. might have to make a policy decision very quickly on this. Uh, yeah, that's uh, a good idea. They'll send it to the editor-in-chief, say, what do you think about this? Because you know, I think it would be nice to perpetuate that into virology even. So, But I don't want to jeopardize. I would do it if it were just me. It doesn't matter, but... I don't want to jeopardize the other authors on the paper. 
Yeah, there's some people who would argue that archive is all that we should do. You know, this is sort of the mm. physics model that uh, that's where the papers need to go. I mean, you do the peer review, if you will, after publication. Mm -hmm. And then mm -hmm. occasionally you will submit that paper for at a conference proceeding down the line. I'm not sure I completely am in favor of that model because I think that peer review actually has an important role to play, mm. especially in our field where, you know, uh, sort of a curiously done study can actually affect you know everybody can read this yeah, and yeah. people start writing blog posts and suddenly you have people who are not vaccinating their kids because there's a sort of a study out there that has this so i think peer review in and the reputation of the journal actually does have an important role to play uh, i just think that it doesn't have to impede the rate at which scientific data can be uh, yeah. disseminated the problem is with with the well, as Arturo calls them, the one-word journals are controlling our careers, and he objects to that. If you have a perfectly good paper that's not reviewed, and that can affect your career if it's not published in one of those journals, or if you get a bad review and they ask for so many experiments that you can't do it. So that's the unfair part of it, right, which maybe archive model would get around. It probably would get around that because the story would get picked up if it's interesting, regardless yeah. of where it is. But I suspect that's happening more and more now. I feel like if there is a paper in your field that you find interesting, it, the model is different than in the old days when you used to just pick up an actual printed copy of Nature or Science yeah, and right, right. leaf through everything. Now you basically find papers on PubMed and each mm -hmm. of us have our own sort of web crawlers that are giving us RSS feeds. And yeah, yeah, yeah. I think I think now if a paper appears in PLOS One or in Journal of Virology or PLOS Pathogens, I suspect it'll get its way to the appropriate reader very quickly. Um, the impact factor is still something that uh, institutions use because there's sort of uh, there's a sort of a lazy sense of how do we evaluate mm -hmm. candidates, et cetera. And yeah, yeah. I suspect that's probably not fair, uh, but I, I don't sort of see that going away very quickly. It's hard to imagine um, tenure committees, you know, having to download the papers and read them instead of saying, oh, this person has 10 cell papers. Sure, no, no problem, right? Which often happens. That does happen, yes. <laughs> it, I know that that works in physics, but it's a much smaller field, right? So I don't know if it would work in biological science. I suspect it's beginning to, the, the population biology experiment in archive is going to be a very mm -hmm. uh, influential one because some of the best population biology papers are now being sent to mm -hmm. archive. And uh, these are papers that, you know, you could uh, argue yeah. would appear. So the the selection is going to come when people might, uh, get some pushback from journals yeah. saying that, yeah, look, yeah. this has already been published. And that will be an interesting debate because it could also be something that the community could stand up for. Mm -hmm. And I think that that'll be a really good experiment that'll ensure that this mm -hmm. would survive. So the individuals in population biology who are sending to archive, they also submit to other journals, That's right? right. Okay. It's not that they're using archive as the main Occasionally place, they have yeah. co-submitted where yeah. th there's already a note that this is under review here yeah. or... Yeah. So do you use RSS feeds primarily to scan the literature? To be honest, I use graduate students yeah. I mean, because I, I, I'm so behind that I get a paper from my, uh, say, have you seen this paper? It's occasionally from my, uh, from my trainees mm -hmm. uh, and they're much more up to date on I literature, see. which is a little bit uh, sort of, I do have RSS feeds, but th it's like the emails that sort of populate your inbox, you know, yeah, after a while sure. you sort of realize you're never going to catch up to the last 18 months of uh, yeah, I'm still papers. looking for, I used to have all the table of contents emailed to me. And then I went to a talk where the, it was about managing your uh, journals. And the guy said, is this what your your inbox looks like? And it was just hundreds and hundreds of unopened table of content emails. And I said, yeah, I never look at any of them. So he said, do RSS. And he said, use Google Reader. And then you can link it to Mendeley or one of these other uh, uh, services where then you could do a one-click store to Mendeley. But now I just look at the RSS feed. But I do have a lot of people sending us, uh, sending me papers as well. So that helps my students and postdocs and and all the TWIV listeners do send papers as well. And that seems to be enough to um, keep us going. But the interesting thing is when I do go and read an RSS feed, I find tons of other stuff that I would miss otherwise. But I'm always curious. I think there has to be a really streamlined way to do this. And 
I'm but one sure. of the one of the issues that I think I'm facing now, which I, I suspect is relatively new, is there's just a lot of very interesting papers out there, and it's I, I think even physically impossible to. Uh, read all of them with the same level of focus that you would have read them, uh, you know, previously, and and so you sort of yeah. you're yeah. automatically prioritizing. Okay, I'm going to read this paper, and I'm not going to be able to read this yeah, uh, yeah. paper. No, I, I, I uh, read one of your papers last night that I had. It was a, actually a review about paleovirology you wrote with Mike Emmerman That's years right. ago, right? Yeah, and this is the plus biology. Yeah, review. and I had never read it. I'd seen it all the time. I'd read the abstract, so I said, I want to really read this. And it's a luxury in a, in a sense. You know, when, I, when I'm ready to go to sleep, I read a book to relax, you know, fiction or something. But last night I said, I'm going to read this because... It really it's good uh, bedtime material. It's good stuff. Well, not that it puts you to sleep, but it's thought-provoking. It, and something like that makes you think. And if you can just find a little time, you know, in a busy day, you, you think it's a luxury to read a whole paper so you don't do it. But I think it's important. You can get... I always found that I get good ideas from reading other papers. You know, so I want to do that. Um, I want to figure out how you how you came to where you are. So you your general interest is um, genetic conflicts. Right? That's correct. And you do that in viruses, but you also do it in multicellular organisms too. I do. Okay? Yeah. Um, and and I'd like to talk about the virus part, and that's what we did in in New Orleans as well. I want to figure out how you got to that point. Now I, I have your CV here, and I know you went to the University of Rochester. You got a master's and a PhD there. So, um, you, had you so you were eighteen by the time you went to Rochester, right? Or I was about twenty actually when I started in the PhD program. Yeah. Um, uh, so, how many of those years were in the U.S. versus India? All of them were All in them? India. Yeah, so I came straight to University of Rochester to do my PhD. So you picked it from India. Why did you do? How did you pick Rochester? Yeah, it's uh, that's interesting. So when I was in India, I was actually a chemical engineering major right. in college right. and. And uh, by my junior year, I had made two important uh, determinations. One was I was a terrible chemical engineer mm -hmm. student, and uh, I was getting very interested in biology, and specifically molecular biology. I was reading Ben Lewin's book, uh, right. Genes, and uh, reading Richard Dawkins. And so I made the very curious decision of applying specifically to departments who had people studying mobile genetic elements. So Rochester mm -hmm. had my PhD advisor was Tom Eichbusch, who was one of the uh, prominent people studying one class of mobile elements. But mm -hmm. I also applied to other places, and 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 some places were uh, very nervous about the fact that I did not have a single biology course on my transcript, and some <laughs> of them actually asked me if I was applying to the right department. And uh, but uh, so, some uh, departments were very brave, yeah. I would say, in retrospect, and. Um, I, I've sat on graduate selection committees, and I've often wondered if my application came by my desk today, how would I react to something like that? And hmm. so I'm really grateful to the committee yeah, that yeah. that did pick me. So, so chemical engineer—that's what Sarah was, wasn't she? That she was a chemical yeah. engineer too, and actually she also worked in a petrochemical plant. Yeah. And to her, that was her epiphany—that she did not want to do that. Yeah, yeah, she told us about that. She worked on a on a rig in the Gulf. Or yeah, so I was very uh, sympathetic to her. <laughs> well, uh, you never reason. got to the rig part, right? I actually uh, got to. The the rig part during my training, but I never yeah. actually worked as a chemical engineer. So you, you went to Rochester with the idea of working on mobile genetic elements, but you didn't have evolution in your sites at that point, That's right? right. I was much more interested in mechanism, actually, okay. specifically biochemistry. And so I was lucky in a sense that the lab I joined had both biochemistry and evolution going on at the same time. Mm -hmm. And then because we were all presenting in the same lab meetings, it became clear to me that the questions that were much more interesting to me, and actually the ones that I was really good at were primarily genetic and evolutionary. In, mm -hmm. in, in And so it was this sort of seamless event where uh, my advisor and I said, well, this is what I should be really doing. Mm -hmm. And I don't think we even ever discussed that. That just happened to be what I uh, started doing. So what did you end up working on? So I, w I worked on phylo phylogenetic reconstruction, actually, which sounds boring, but uh, at the point, the dogma in the field was mobile genetic elements hopped around a lot. Actually, mm -hmm. we had learned from uh, Margaret Kidwell's work that P elements can transfer between different species of Drosophila and Mariner elements. Um, and what Tom's lab was beginning to find out was that actually that was not true for all mobile elements. And he was studying these mobile elements that always inserted into the ribosomal DNA of uh, mm -hmm. insects. And because they always were in the same place, we could actually amplify them no matter what species of insect we were looking at. And he re recognized that the elements 
and the host genomes they came from mm-hmm. basically were co-speciating, which was incredible. And I was able to extend that all the way back to the origin of arthropods, and which is like 600 million years of evolution mm-hmm. where these mobile elements have been, you know, mainstays in the genome, if you mm-hmm. will. And then going further back, I was able to actually track it to the origin of eukaryotic genomes. So these so-called non-LTR yeah. retrotransposons have been basically hitchhikers in eukaryotic right. genomes with very little evidence of horizontal transfer of any sort. Um, so you did this with existing sequence? I did this, and this has been NCBI, and Gen- GenBank was really becoming. And so I became really good at looking for patterns and looking for uh, homology detection. That was sort of in its infancy mm-hmm. at that time. Um, but uh, I could basically, there was a point where I could look at a protein sequence and tell you if this was a reverse transcriptase purely by mm-hmm. pattern matching, which was a little scary, I think. So um, did you develop uh, computer programs to do this? I or? developed yeah. a small computer program and actually adapted others that were already present. Mm-hmm. And uh that became sort of uh, so. Then I expanded out to other retro elements. So yeah. I was able to show that retroviruses have also had this very interesting modular evolution mm-hmm. where they've gained and lost domains, and uh, that sort of was inspiring because I was basically providing phylogenetic frameworks, mm-hmm. and then I could see that framework being used because I've, I had a biochemistry uh, graduate student uh, colleague in the lab who used my framework to actually figure out this missing missing enzymatic activity, which mm-hmm. everybody suspected was there, but really nobody knew where it was. And right. I was able to actually propose the existence of this, and she was able to prove it. And that became this powerful uh, sort of message for myself in, in early in my training that this combination of evolution and functional biology mm-hmm. was very powerful. Uh, and yeah. that's what I sort of wanted to do for yeah. the rest of my career. So did the computing uh, expertise come from having the chemical engineering? It probably helped. Uh, yeah. There was a lot of mathematics yeah. involved and, and that uh, helped. But I also had really good teachers, actually. Tom himself was had very good intuition about it, but actually there was a senior graduate student in the lab, Trey Lath, who was very mm-hmm. patient about teaching uh, you know, phylogenetics. Mm-hmm. And, and it was really... He was a born teacher, actually. And, mm-hmm. and so there was really... <laughs> awesome to learn that yeah. you know so was this the beginning of this old notion of of tracking uh you know genes through time and and their function and and their conflicts yes this this was i was i would i would say i was sort of in the middle of that revolution uh-huh. but as more and more data became available it became clear that mm-hmm. this was the way to track innovations in genes, you know, innovations in gene copy number, and then acquisition of new functions as the gene was going through evolution. Of course, without sequencing, you couldn't have done that, obviously. That's right. I mean, it would be uh, easy, but it would be very anecdotal because it would be, uh, in a sense, per case study, like, uh, you know, and so. Who else was in this field at the time that you were working on your PhD? So in the virology side of things, uh, there were a couple of people who were very interested in RNA viruses, for instance. And uh, uh, Eugene Kunin was actually okay. uh, by far right. the person who had the most prolific uh, insights. I mean, uh, and amazing in terms of actually even identifying and proposing mm. completely new enzymatic activities purely based on homology detection. Right. And, and that was sort of inspiring because almost all of his uh, predictions have turned out to be correct, which is amazing. <clears throat> Yeah, he and another fellow whose name escapes me first looked at the Pocorna virus protease. The Arvind, I think. Arvind and Kunin, there were like yeah. many papers. And they like, said this is going to be a protease. And I remember I was pretty young at the time. And yeah. I said, well, how did they do that? <laughs> and it turned out all to be true. Both proteases were correct. You mentioned Mariner. So that, I just want to take a little side. You probably know that one of these big Mimi-like viruses has... Maybe it was Cafeteria renbergensis virus that has a mariner-like element in it. That's right. Yeah, yeah. and actually they might even have a, a non-autonomous mariner-like mm-hmm. parasite of that yeah. full-length mariner in it. So you follow these giant viruses at all? It's just curious because I, I mean, I always get asked questions about where do you call viruses in the sort of framework of life, and you know, yeah. the people who are conveniently saying, well, there's a genome size argument to be made. But Mimi viruses clearly throw that out of the window. So it's and a, a filterable size, too. They they broke that rule, too, Exactly, right? exactly. 0.2 micron filter. 
But it is all about autonomy, right? In the end, Mimi still have to infect the cell. That's exactly right. So I prefer the Patrick Forte definition, which is you view the virus as a virus, and then you view the mm-hmm. cell infected with the virus as a viral cell. That's right. And I like that. So I, we've always dis- debated about whether viruses are living or not. And his argument is the virus particle is not, but when it infects the cell, it's it's living, and that makes perfect sense to me. Otherwise, you keep arguing forever and ever That's about right. that, yeah. right? Um, we we um, <clears throat> there's been a new uh, giant virus discovered. You probably saw in contact lens solution in France, and this, and with it came another of these so-called virophages. This is from Didier Rolls' work. Yeah, and- it just published this week. And all the stories in the popular science press. A virus that infects, another virus that infects a virus. And uh, I wrote to a few of these authors and said, you know, that it's not quite right. I know you want to be brief, but it, you can't infect another virus unless you infect the virus infected cell. But it's very interesting. People are very surprised at this, but we've known about uh, helper viruses for years, right? That's right, yes. There are plenty of examples. I mean, Delta hepatitis is a great example. There are plenty of plant viruses that need a helper. They can't replicate on their own, even in a cell. So it seems that there's not a long memory, right? You have to uh, always keep teaching people the same thing over and over again. So you finished this PhD. Then what um, What kinds of thoughts did you have about a postdoc? Where did you want to head? So I actually went to apply to Steve Hanikoff's lab. This was sort of interesting because he was developing these remote homology methods, which I felt like I could uh, really uh, use in my uh, training. But when I went there, he basically, uh, to, for an interview, uh, it was a fantastic interview, but he told me that he doesn't want to do too much homology detection because NCBI was doing a much better job of sort of uh, computationally making this. So Cyblast was actually coming online. Instead, he told me about this really curious story of uh, centromeres, which was, mm-hmm. uh, you, know, you know, so being involved with retrotransposons and their genomic counterparts, I was always interested in how the genome deals with these denizens of its genome. And he told me about centromeres because uh, he felt like centromeres were this very poorly understood component of eukaryotic uh, mm-hmm. genomes. And I remember this conversation very well because we were at this Middle Eastern restaurant and the conversation started with him telling me that he was not interested in continuing to work on what I was interested in. <laughs> so I was thinking, okay, so this interview is probably over. And at the end, I was convinced I needed to work on centromeres. And it was just uh, this wonderful back and forth between us. So, so I actually formally started thinking about genetic conflicts, I think, at the end of that conversation. Because even though I thought about mobile genetic elements and their selfish propagation in host genomes. I never really paid attention to the dynamics back and forth that must be going Mm -hmm. on between these Mm -hmm. elements. And centromeres actually provide a really good example of something which is so fundamental to the cell and yet can be shaped by genetic conflict, you know, and that happens because of the fact that only one out of four products of meiosis in eggs Mm -hmm. actually are retained in the egg and the other three are destroyed. And that sort of became a really important theme for me to just explore because it revealed to me that whenever you have a conflict like that, regardless of whether it's an essential process or a a non-essential process, you get a lot of innovation. Mm -hmm. And I had gotten really good at seeing signatures of that innovation. And so I sort of flipped the thing on its head and said, that I can look for signatures of innovation, potentially even identify new conflicts mm-hmm. where others have not. So the conflict arises because one of the four centromere or, or copies of the chromosome only can be passed on. That's right. And so the chromosome oh. that is best at actually cheating in female meiosis <laughs> does the best job of, of, of taking advantage of this yeah. uh, non-Mendelian inheritance. And, and, and you were interested in finding out what gives a particular chromosome an advantage. That's right. And how the genome actually deals with that. Because Mm -hmm. even though this is great for the chromosome that's cheating, it's terrible for the rest of the genome because Mm -hmm. it's actually reducing your genetic uh, diversity. And then you could have hitchhiking of other selfish elements along that. And so what I recognized was that uh, in my postdoc was that centromeric proteins, which are Mm -hmm. all essential for every cell cycle, Mm -hmm. Uh, are actually evolving under what we call positive selection, just like immunity genes are. And that was a sort of r- real surprise to, to think that mm-hmm. something so fundamental could actually be constantly shaped by this genetic conflict, but only in systems where you have this one out of four paradigm. So in mm-hmm. budding yeast, all four products of meiosis are always sort of propagated. Mm-hmm. 
and you don't see this uh, yeah, uh, sure. this sort of uh, conflict. And so the idea that you could take these evolutionary patterns, deduce a conflict, and even actually test them using the same sort of evolutionary data that's out there, became very uh, compelling for me. So, so you uh, you continue this line of work too? I do. So right? half my lab focuses on this idea that these conflicts at centromeres could even mm-hmm. actually drive the uh, separation between species where when you bring two species together, yeah. their progeny are often inviable or sterile. Mm-hmm. And that could be because of fundamental mismatch in their centromere binding proteins. And, the and you do this in what organism? Mostly in Drosophila. Drosophila. Yeah. So I go back to my training in, in my graduate school, which was also focused on Drosophila mm-hmm. retrotransposons. So you finished this postdoc on centromeres and then you got a job. At the Hutch, I presume that was your first job. That's you're, right. You're going to be yes. there 30 years, you think? <laughs> <laughs> like I've been here. <laughs> I think it's it's remarkable that you've been here, but I suspect <laughs> that the reason you've been here is because you have good resonance with this place. And mm-hmm. I, I feel like I have really good resonance. I have great colleagues. There's real, no reason yeah. to leave. Yeah. No, uh, the colleagues are, are everything. Yeah. Right? Your colleagues and then the people who come to your lab. So for me, that's been fine. So I didn't want to leave. And so you started the lab to work on the centromere problem, I presume, right? That's right. And actually, I got I gave all my job interviews with mm-hmm. the idea of working on a centromere problem. I did not actually intentionally do this, but it was made aware to me that because I was staying in the same place as my postdoctoral advisor, I probably wanted to do something slightly different. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. And already Steve Hanikoff and I had discussed this. And so I was focused much more on the evolution. He was focused on the biochemistry of centromeric proteins. But Michael Emmerman, actually in my very first retreat as a faculty member, Mm -hmm. about a month after I joined as a faculty member. So I had known about Michael Emmerman. I was good friends with postdocs in his lab, actually. Um, But I sort of viewed him as this HIV virologist who was really dissecting, which is actually completely true. Mm -hmm. Uh, But then he talked about this... uh, wonderful story that had just begun to emerge from Michael Malam's lab where he had discovered uh, apobec 3G as a restriction factor and then the counter defense encoded by HIV, the VIF protein. And I went to him at the end of his talk and it was literally mm-hmm. a 10 minute, no data slides talk, you know, mm-hmm. just talking about concepts. And I said, that's fantastic. That's a genetic conflict. So what do you know about its evolution? And he said, I don't know anything. We, nobody's really looked at it. You probably never thought of it as a conflict. Right? That's right. I mean, I think it was just the sort of evolutionary framework, this idea that this is a conflict. It should predictably give rise to innovation. And as luck would have it, Sarah Sawyer had just joined my mm-hmm. lab actually a month ago. And she was sort of uh, working on a centromere related project. But as mm-hmm. soon as we had this conversation, I was like, I think you should work on this. And it didn't take a lot of convincing. And Mm -hmm. she just had this knack and intuition to really take over. And that was sort of... And so even now, I mean, even though half my lab works on host virus interactions, almost all of that Mm -hmm. is done in collaboration with Michael and Adam Jabal, who was a box virologist there. I met him when when I visited as well. That's right. Um, I think so. I think this is the key here. You put a new spin on something that we been working on forever right so i always thought about virus host interactions but in a different sense i I thought the virus needs some host proteins and that's it we study how that works but the idea of a conflict never never crossed my mind until i i read your work and that's what, what what i think is really key if you can make those kind of leaps and take something that everyone works on and put a new spin on it so that you really move forward that that's that's the important part. You know what I mean, right? Yes, yes. So I I, I think it was it was refreshing for me because I was very interested in studying consequences of rapid evolution. But you know, the right. centromere right. projects they take years. <laughs> you know, you do gene swaps <laughs> and stuff. And here was this amazing system. I mean, host yeah. virus interactions are so dynamic and so consequential in terms of their function that we could do. We were writing the first paper, actually, within a year of this conversation. Uh, It was just so dramatic. I mean, it was just one of the most amazing signatures that we had seen for a very long time. So within a year, you had gotten your first publication. This was Sarah's first paper. This was Sarah's first publication. So what did you do to get that? So what we did was we actually sequenced the apobec 3G gene from a bunch of primates. And what we showed was that there was indeed the signature of apobec, but what was surprising and even surprising today is even though apobec is locked in this arms race with vif which is an mm-hmm. hiv protein we could show that the rapid evolution of apobec was you know much much older hundreds of millions mm-hmm. of years old suggesting that apobec had basically been 
locked in an antagonistic relationship with something mm-hmm. uh, for much longer than HIV has you know even right. been in existence and so we proposed that this conflict was actually with endogenous retro elements like the ones that I studied in graduate school you know w- which were yeah. genome bound <laughs> but actually gametically trying to increase yeah. copy number and lots of people have now shown that this is actually true so you think that apobec might be methylating these invasive so it's a DNA? deaminating them de-aminating. in the cor- in the course of their and so basically preventing their uh, uh, successful integration into can the you genome. test that yes so people we and others have mm-hmm. tested that and it makes a huge impact actually wow. so it's almost as effective against things like uh, alu elements and line mm-hmm. 1 as it is against hiv so so hiv hasn't been around long enough to see any selection of if so areas, that's what right? we thought in the first paper actually we are, we are mm-hmm. uh, that was a conclusion that we made but that was based on relatively little sequence mm-hmm. uh, information mm-hmm. we had about 12 or 13 primates More recently Michael Emmerman's lab has actually looked at this in much more detail in the old world monkeys which probably cohabited right, with right. SIV for much longer and he's finding that at least as far as those monkeys are concerned uh, there has been actually a long history of this coevolution between mm-hmm. VIF and apobec and and so that initial conclusion that very little of apobec evolution is actually driven by VIF mm-hmm. was probably not completely correct right, okay. um and, and that was partly because we were looking at such deep evolution that we missed the really rapid shallow evolution that was happening yeah. um because the lentis are millions and millions of years old so that's right. Tell, yeah. right yeah at least i think the current uh, uh current sort of timeline is 12 million years 12 million yeah, yeah. But it could still be that it that uh, mobile elements played a role as well, right? That's right. I mean, um, we we've had this sort of debate even within the lab, and I suspect that both of those are true. Uh, the one thing about these mobile elements is that almost every mammal has them. I mean, they're, mm-hmm. they're, they're just never, as I said, they're stably hitchhiked with these right. uh, genomes, and so you would have had to invent something to try to curb their influence mm-hmm. and. Uh, mm-hmm. obviously because of the reverse transcription step it became a very useful tool against retroviruses as well so the mobile elements that we have these are all the lines and signs and retro elements etc right that's in our, right in our yeah. genome which are like 40 total 40% of our genome or something actually that's most people think that's an underestimate now <laughs> just based on the, the the fact that the really short segments really lose some homology uh-huh. quickly um uh, yeah so so like mouse and the human genome is chock full of these elements but yeah. the one big difference is that mouse also had a lot of endogenous retroviruses yeah. whereas we have no active endogenous retroviruses right, in our genome right. So. Uh, so are we unusual in that sense or I mean uh, mice have active uh, koalas seem to be acquiring active endogenous viruses what about other species I think even within primates we're unusual. unusual I think there yeah. are very I don't I'm not aware of any other primate that mm-hmm. has completely lost all active endogenous retroviruses so uh. chimps for instance have uh endogenous retroviruses mm-hmm. also and they make virus particles yeah, yeah. So do we have any sense for so, why we so don't so one of these uh human endogenous uh, viruses also makes virus particles but it turns out that a single provirus cannot actually make both the gag pull and envelope right. so people have speculated that you could actually make a chimeric frankenstein virus from mm. components that are distributed in the genome hmm. that's formally possible although it's never been really demonstrated but if you look at ovarian cancer samples you can actually see uh stereotypical retroviral really? capsids actually you know i'm remembering a paper of a couple of years ago where they looked at patients with als and they said there were increased reverse transcriptase that seemed to be particle associated in them You, you aware of that? I'm not aware of this no, but so, it wouldn't surprise me because any kind of stress. I mean, so yeah. people have looked at HIV infected cells and yeah. shown that that actually leads to a sort of a inactivation of the quiescence mm-hmm. of these mobile elements. And I suspect what's going on is that there's only so many defense mechanisms at play and when a, a virus like HIV mm-hmm. enters the cell, you're yeah. sort of subverting yeah. so much of the you know defense mechanisms that that allows the release of these mobile elements from silencing so do we understand or have ideas why we don't have more endogenous i suspect it's completely stochastic i mean we okay. had a burst of a new uh, herve or a human endogenous yeah. retroviral activity we suspect that went sort of extinct about 
a million years to two million years ago. So mm-hmm. I suspect it's completely stochastic. It is also possible that, you know, we are not uh, living as intimately with mm. uh, primate sort of uh, relatives as we were perhaps in our history. And mm. and what's clear is that most of the viruses that we have acquired, at least retroviruses, have been because of close association. HIV is a very good example of that uh, with other primates. Yeah, and, yeah. So, but is it possible that somewhere on Earth there is a group of people that do have active herbs that we don't know about? Uh, it is. It is not uh, impossible <laughs> that that's true. Uh, it's, I, I sus- the reason I say this is because one of these uh, herbs is still polymorphic, uh-huh. which means that all people on the planet have the same repertoire of these fossilized versions. Mm-hmm. But one of these versions is actually uh, recent enough that. People are polymorphic. I think it's 18% frequency. I think John Coffin's lab showed it very nicely mm-hmm. that uh, that is a. It's completely possible that one of these uh, sort of rare proviruses is still capable of making virus-like yeah. particles and. Or it affecting. could be that at this moment someone's gene, gene um, germline is being invaded by one. Yeah. So people have looked very closely at HIV for that yeah, reason because yeah. I mean this is something which is. Um, I suspect that comes down to receptor usage. Mm-hmm. I mean, the germline is something that has sort of a privileged receptor pool, yeah, yeah. and HIV just doesn't have the right uh, uh, abilities to infect. Uh, if someone were someone's germline today were invaded by HIV and it integrated, how many years would it take before that propagated in in the population so that we would pick it up? I think I think if it was as rare as you recommend, most likely we would never pick never. it up. You know, because the it needs to make an imprint in the germline stem cell. That germ cell needs to make it to to to, to actually produce sperm or eggs, yeah. most likely sperm, and that needs to go on to make another individual in the next generation, and that individual needs to propagate that version. Wow. And, and so all of those are low probability events, which is why it's staggering to think that. Forty percent of our genome yeah, has yeah. become mobile elements, in spite of all of those odds that I just mentioned. It's it, having so much is is um, a little uh, staggering, and especially if nothing else is happening now, right? So there must have been an event a long time ago that established all of these. Yeah. So the with retroviruses, that's the beauty of it, because these have left these endogenous fossil yeah. records. We can actually precisely date when these waves of retroviral invasions. And it's pretty clear that Mm -hmm. we had waves at every point in primate evolution of new Mm -hmm. viruses that uh, probably were perfectly infectious but capable of infecting exactly like the koala retrovirus is doing currently. So as you go back in primate evolution, there are fewer and fewer endogenous integrations, is that correct? Uh, There are fewer events just mostly because there is now an ascertainment bias because the further back you go, your ability to date and recognize these events I goes see, down. I, I suspect okay. that these were not fewer. I think there's been a very steady, steady. Okay. Uh, influence. And uh, we just don't recognize the ancient ones any exactly. longer. Yeah. Yeah. So one thing we should do before we go on is define positive selection because there are probably some people that don't know what that means. What is it? So, so the way to think about positive selection in a protein coding gene is right. because of the degeneracy of the genetic code, not all nucleotide substitutions are going to lead to an amino acid change. Mm -hmm. So those that do not, we refer to them as silent or synonymous changes, whereas those that do, we call replacement or non-synonymous changes. Now, we make a big assumption here, which is that synonymous changes are essentially neutral, which means selection can't see them because they don't result in a protein coding change. Mm -hmm. That's an assumption which we know is false in some organisms. But it still helps us to make that assumption because then we can compare the rate of non-synonymous to synonymous Mm -hmm. changes to really precisely tell us what is the selective constraint acting on that gene. So for instance, if you have a complete pseudogene, which does not encode for a protein, Mm -hmm. what you're going to get is an accurate readout of how mutation has affected this part of the gene with no influence of selection. So there we find that the rate of non-synonymous change and synonymous changes Mm -hmm. is basically the same. Uh, most genes in the human genome, I would say 85%, we have the same comparison will reveal that the rate of replacement changes is far less than the replacement uh, than the rate of synonymous changes. Mm-hmm. And that's because most of the protein coding alterations that have occurred in evolution were probably deleterious to function, yeah. have been removed. Okay. And so we call that purifying selection. Okay. Selections acted to purify the population. Whereas positive selection, the things that we're very interested in are things where you're sort of breaking the speed limit. If the speed limit is the mm-hmm. rate of silent changes, you're actually changing non-synonymous or amino acids 
faster than you could even change silent positions. And that's because these are sort of presumably so advantageous that they're going to fixation sure. at a faster rate. And so okay. positive selection is because selection has positively f- favored the fixation of and these so changes. so a mutation in a... In a in a cellular gene that's targeted by a virus would be positively selected because it lets you survive and your offspring survive. That's right? exactly that's right. Idea. Yeah. So MHC is the classic example of something <clears throat> that's under positive selection, but gives you uh, the antigen recognition repertoire right. that you need. Right. And that's why on a small island population, it's less diverse than on a continental population because there's less less selection pressures to generate the diversity as well. That's right. I mean, the effective population size plays a very important yeah. role in this as well. Yeah. So um, a non-coding region changes kind of break that assumption of synonymous changes because they could have a biological effect, right? Yes. In fact, uh, genome-wide studies in both human and Drosophila have shown that uh, both in the 5 prime, 3 prime UTR, there, there are definitely changes associated with positive selection as mm-hmm. well. Um, and the reason that's a little tricky is because there's not an internal metric like the synonymous chain site. And so mm-hmm. what people do in those cases is compare the rate of changes, let's say in a 5 prime untranslated region, right. compared to, say, the intron of the gene. And one of those you assume to be really a surrogate for neutral. Yeah. But then it gets a little tricky. So. Then you have all these um, small RNA regions, which we all th- we used to think was junk, and now it's not. That's right. So changes in those could also have consequences. Yeah, right? so actually, I'm, I'm very interested in that topic uh-huh. per se, and because it turns out that if you look at the microRNAs, for instance, that are yeah. integrated within the cell's uh, you know, developmental profile, mm-hmm. those are very slow to evolve. In contrast, if you actually look at microRNAs that are actually encoded by viruses, and so Brian Cullen and colleagues have right. shown that many of these viruses encode specific microRNAs to mess with the host uh, mm-hmm. system that they're infecting, those are not actually slowly evolving. In cor- they're actually very rapidly evolving. And the, sort of my intuition suggests that there might be some very interesting adaptation or conflict going on there as well. But nobody's really looked at that in a sort of a very uh, systematic way. So his his um, microRNAs are in DNA. Large in DNA, DNA viruses, viruses that's right. right, yeah. And there's a lot of controversy o- over whether they exist in other viruses as well, Yeah, right? so uh, th- there's some evidence that there are small RNAs at least generated in the course yeah. of things like influenza. Benjamin Tenover, who's mm-hmm. uh, here in right. New York, has shown some very nice data. Um, in the sense that they are microRNAs, they probably are not microRNAs in the way we think about it. But they could easily be things that are interfering with some aspect of uh, host machinery, right. either by uh, acting as a dominant negative or actually making these sort of... Uh, um, I think that, again, purely selective constraints, you know, parts of the genome of, say, a polio virus or an influenza mm-hmm. virus, that's not really evolving as rapidly as maybe it ought to, right? That is a really good clue that something interesting is going on here beyond just protein mm-hmm. conservation. Mm-hmm. And so I suspect that mo- we'll hear much more about that. I have to write down a few things. Before I forget to talk about them, let's see, what should I do right now? There's so many cool things. All right, so reading this article last night, I have to get back to something else. Okay, Reading this article gave me this nice um, overview that you can look at conflicts either by doing things like the Apelbeck-Vif analysis, um, or you can look at pieces of viral genomes that are integrated and work back from that, right? That's correct. Uh, so um, there, there are lots of, there are these uh, retroviral remnants in our genomes. And then in the last couple of years, we've found that there are other pieces of other viral genomes in They're there. They're spectacular, yes. Uh, they totally changed the way we think about the age and the evolution yeah. of these viruses. And uh, and it's important to emphasize that these non-retroviral uh, imprints, they're completely stochastic in the sense yeah. many of them yeah. are like RNA viruses that you never expect to go through this phase which right. would allow them to be integrated. But nonetheless, they've been captured in germline yeah. genomes. So those are even less likely sure. to propagate. And, and yet we can see them. But the beauty of this is that let's say you have an imprint of uh, Ebola virus that is actually mm-hmm. found in the common ancestor of, let's say, all bats. Right. Now, we know what how old the common ancestor of all bats was. And so if this imprint is exactly in the same location in all of these genomes, we know that this virus was at least these many millions of years old. Right. And what that, is, that has done is actually completely... Re- 
changed our view of how old are these wire lineages mm-hmm. we used to think about them as you know on the order of perhaps hundreds of thousands and millions of years old partly because if you back calculate you know based on the rate of mutation mm-hmm. all of the existing diversity it goes back to a single point you know within 100000 years yeah. and we know that's that's completely <laughs> not correct anymore yeah, yeah. and so So it's millions and millions of years. It's millions right? of years. In the case of the Ebola virus, it's easily a hundred million years wow. old. So, so I remember the first one found was a was it a parvovirus piece of a f- genome in the in the genome. Uh, there were a couple of them. Actually, the Borna virus Borna, probably right. is the is the one that got the that most initial attention. And that was strange because Borna is an RNA virus. That's exactly. So right. there has to be some random copying of the viral genome. Because the and and not only that it's a new you know most people believe it's actually got neurotropism so yeah. to find a borna viral yeah. imprint that's in the germ line i right. mean that's really a mystery that still right? still <laughs> remains to be solved exactly and this is not any any part of the viral life cycle to do this right that's and right. the reverse transcriptase comes from an endogenous element most likely right? comes from line one actually yeah. that one of these uh, retro elements we were so discussing so these these um, jumping dnas these mobile elements are helping other mobile elements to come in as well right so it has to copy this borna dna then it has to randomly get into well i guess the borna is in the nucleus but other non nuclear viruses get in anyway so That's the right. cell is very sloppy it takes up nucleic acids randomly and then it integrates um and we've only discovered a handful of viruses but you said in that article probably they're all there we just haven't found them yet. That's right. I mean in fact if you look at just the great diversity of mm. negative and positive strand RNA viruses there's very few families of viruses that are now not represented in any mammalian genome and since we're sequencing mammalian genomes yeah. you know by the day we're going to we'll we're them. going to find probably all more them. data than people can in- yeah. analyze. I mean now if there are these uh, uh it's still possible to publish really interesting yeah. journal of virology papers about these endogenous viruses because again they they keep changing our but i suspect after that it's not even going to be as yeah. interesting as unless you've got something really old um so th- in terms of this really old thing i mean uh, uh michael warby actually found uh, a fomi viral remnant mm. in in coelacanths and and based on the data that he uh coelacanths those are the ancient fish that are the still ancient around, fish right? right and so we we wow. we're talking you know and if this was a co-speciation event which he makes a strong case for mm-hmm. that's just you know we're talking you know many many yeah, million sure. hundreds of millions of years ago that these viruses and so the the it does two things for us one is mm-hmm. it gives us really good insight into what these viruses might have looked like especially right. if some of these genes have been preserved which is another really cool aspect of it. Mm. The second thing it does is it actually makes perfectly clear that these host virus arms races that we claim are playing out have really been playing out. There's nothing unusual about primate evolution yeah. or even yeah. mammalian evolution. They've been going on for essentially throughout our existence. How, why can we still recognize them if they're there for hundreds of millions of years? Yeah, so that's a really good question. So most of the time I think we're not recognizing them. Okay. The reason we are recognizing many of them is because in mammalian genomes the rate of decay is really poor so what that means is a pseudo gene for instance which mm-hmm. has no protein coding mm-hmm. gene potential still can be recognized as having homology to the original gene it came yeah. from for hundreds of millions of years and that's probably helping us why mammalian genomes have been this treasure trove for discovering these viruses right. and less of a treasure trove than in invertebrate retroviruses because those are actually much less hospitable to a uh, dna that's uh, you know potentially not some of these though are recognizable because they're actually still coding for active open yeah, reading frames yeah, yeah, yeah. and those i think are the most surprising and perhaps the most stunning examples of maybe hosts are domesticating a viral born gene uh to you know you do its own function we have mm. we should be prepared for this outcome because the syncytin gene is a right. perfect right. example of host stealing genes uh for this um but i have to say i was still surprised i mean this uh vp35 relative and the n proteins mm-hmm. from ebola have been apparently domesticated this is a very nice paper by derek taylor uh in uh in ancestors of bats and maybe that's going to tell us clues about why is it that bats are a reservoir species for these viruses maybe they have some almost genomic immunization against these viruses that are sort mm-hmm. of helping them and so i think it can actually tell us a lot about the life history of these viruses so it could be that even more than 40% of our genome is as you said earlier is mobile elements or integrated viral 
sequences. Yes. So we're mostly bacteria, and we're going to end up, most of our DNA is not ours, so... We're really hybrids, aren't we? <laughs> well, I, I prefer to think of us as we're classic survivors we that are, are sort of uh, taking advantage of, of. So, I mean, this brings up the question. Someone here a few weeks ago suggested that um, viruses actually originated from cells. And um, I sort of poo pooed it, but maybe that's the case. Maybe they were always there and then they figured out a way to to exit and become mobile. Yeah, I mean, I don't know how to answer that. This is a question that I've wrestled with. But, you know, there is a simpler uh, question which also roiled the uh, retrovirus community a long Mm -hmm. time ago, Mm -hmm. back to Temin and Baltimore, which was, which came first? Were retroviruses original and they lost their ability to infect and became retrotransposons because those retrotransposons have the exact same life cycle? Or or was it that these retrotransposons actually acquired the envelope gene and became an infectious retrovirus? So again, because of sequence uh, information, we can actually answer that question. Mm -hmm. And it's pretty clear that retroviruses, the infectious state, is the derived state, which means retrotransposons, again, happen to stochastically steal the uh, um, membrane-spanning potential or the infectious Mm -hmm. potential of other viruses and have basically now adopted that infectious lifestyle. So I suspect that in terms of thinking back to the RNA world, I mean, we probably always had situations where, you know, even ribozymes are probably parasites of other ribozymes and taking advantage of that. And so this relationship... As long as there's an yeah. opportunity to take advantage of another sort of system, I think you would always do that. I see viruses as being just that, the ultimate sort of genetic parasites. Yeah, they're very sophisticated and complicated. Yeah. But back in the RNA world, as you say, they were probably viruses. You would just not recognize them today as a virus, but they probably parasitized other, other nucleic acids that were that floating were, around, exactly. right? Exactly, who had abilities to do polymerase function, et cetera, and they were just taking advantage right. of that. Yeah, yeah I mean, I, I mentioned that as a possibility in my course, that viruses were actually there first, before cellular life, right, in this soup that used to exist, and students get confused, but I thought a virus had to get into a cell. <laughs> but maybe then... I mean, that would be a virus you would not recognize today. That's right. And you could even argue that the original symbiosis of all of the enzymatic functions you Mm. needed to make a cell, you probably selected on components of uh, sort of the self-replicating ribozymes in almost in a traditional sort of viral sense, because these got better and better at taking advantage. And suddenly you sort of created a symbiosis of these previously self-replicating entities. And that was the original. So, of course, there's no direct evidence for for some of this. uh, uh, It probably never will be, right? Well, there's some really cool work happening about uh, original protocells, et cetera, from people like Jack Shrostak. I think we might might see some Mm -hmm. answers. But we'll never necessarily know what actually happened. We might get to know what could happen, though. Yes, that that makes perfect sense. You could reproduce conditions to say, this could have happened then, but you'll never have direct evidence, right? It's just great. That's why I like this area, because it makes you think in different ways and, and probe problems that you couldn't figure out before. Um, so the original, the point you made not too long ago, that our original calculation said viruses were 100,000 years old. Now, they're millions of years, and if not more. Why, is, why were we so wrong? We back-calculated on current mutation rates, but why in the genome are the integrated copies so different? So there's two answers for that, actually, mm-hmm. and I, I suspect there's even more that we've not figured out. The first answer is that the viral diversity as it exists today, which is how we made our estimates as to all of these going back to a common ancestor, is probably a very small snapshot of what actually existed. Mm-hmm. Um, the second answer, uh, and that that was revealed by the analysis of these uh, endogenized fossilized viruses, is that the rates of mutation as they exist today in these infectious viruses, like hepatinoviruses is a great example, are far higher than the the mutation rates that we can infer these older viral lineages might have been through. So I suspect that there's been a little bit of a increase or an uptick in mutation rate for some of these RNA viruses. And because of that, we've been fooled into thinking that the common ancestor of these was very young, even though actually in reality it was probably much older. And because the rate and the time to common ancestry is interlinked, you know, an increase in the mutation rate could easily sort of decrease your estimate about the uh, 
a common ancestor. Right. And so I suspect we've been wrong both in terms of the diversity of the viruses that exist as well as the mutation rates that they've been subject to. Okay. And it's, again, something we can't ever prove, but we can... Yeah, so we might... So these endogenous viruses, the beauty of them is they prove it, you know, because if you if you were in the common ancestor of, say, bats and humans yeah, yeah. and the same location in the genome, the probability of getting that event is mm -hmm. so, you know, the less than the Very probability low, yes. that, that it would be, uh, we basically can prove that these viruses, at least as old as the common ancestor right. of bats and humans. So are we going, should we sequence the genome of everything living on Earth to get real, a real sense of, of how this works in every species? Is that worth doing? Well, so there's the, there's a 10,000 mammalian yeah. genome project that's underway. I'm, uh, this might surprise you, but I'm not a huge fan of doing sort of just completely undirected sequencing. It's certainly mm -hmm. cheap enough that we could yeah. think about doing something like that. But uh, I feel like we have a lot of information that we haven't yet. I mean, Mind, from yeah. the purposes of, I suspect that what would be awesome is actually people trying to reconstruct at least some of these viral proteins that we can and try to infer like what's actually going on. And there's just a rich sort mm -hmm. of uh, data set to go after now. And yeah, I don't see yeah. a lot of people rushing to do that. And so uh, it's sequencing more genomes will probably give us more interesting bioinformatic conclusions. Mm -hmm. But I think now we are at the point where we probably could use a lot of functional sort yeah. of paleovirology. So we have enough sequence. We have to work on it now. Yeah, I'll yeah. never say we have enough sequence, but <laughs> the cost uh, sort of benefits yeah. uh, ratio is probably... Uh, trending towards more functional stuff. So do you find this koala story fascinating? I do, yes. It's a, it's just a, also a reminder because we often talk like you do in the community. And, uh, you know, so HIV is, it's so hard to communicate to people that this is a very young virus, even mm. though there's millions mm. and millions of people who have been infected, you know, right. this is something that has actually invaded our species very recently. And the koalas are a perfect example of capturing this in action. I mean, they even have pathogenesis mm -hmm. that's, you know, somewhat on the, uh, the same level. And and yet what makes them really unique and different is they're capturing it in their genome. And so their genome yeah. is now the slate on which these endogenous retroviral record is being written. Yeah. And yet there are others that nothing's been yeah. written yet. And so it's a, it's a beautiful story of actually capturing, you know, multiple states of this endogenization or this retroviral right, infection. Right. In so process. do the koalas have no other endogenous? They or certainly they do. Must, they right? they, they do, do have, you know, and they actually have a relative of this koala retrovirus, mm -hmm. uh, but it's a very distant relative. But they, do they make particles, these other endogenous copies, or are they... I'm defective? actually not aware. I think yeah. they're not uh, capable of uh, transposition anymore. So what will happen? The koalas are mainly Australian, wherever else they ship them. Right, for zoos. That's right. So will this retrovirus eventually spread? It seems to be spreading throughout the population in Australia. I, right? I suspect that'll, that'll happen to the koala mm -hmm. populations. I mean, the only population that has been immune so far has been on this island, you know, in, right. in, in Australia. And all it takes is one or two migration events to do that. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's, it's the same kind of thing, again, going back to my roots and transposable elements. You know, the P elements is the most spectacular example of something like this. So... so Prior to the 1950s, all these Drosophila that were collected all over the world, they, none of them had these P elements. And now, yeah. any yes. fruit fly that you collect after 1950 yeah. is chock full of these elements, yeah. right? So it literally, in, almost in a blink of an eye, if you think about this mm -hmm. in an evolutionary sense, this element is just invaded and now you can't... So it's a great uh, tool for us because we now have these fruit flies that preceded the invasion of P yeah, elements so we right. can study what happened. But it's pretty clear like there's a very dramatic sort of bias towards the transmission of the element. So what will happen... Uh, by the way, I think the Kangaroo Island now has some... Is that right? It now has some... I think so. I think I, I just saw that, yeah. Um, what will happen with the koalas? I assume some of them survive infection. They don't all die of uh, chlamydial infections, right? So will this eventually be in all koalas and then just be passed on? I suspect two things might happen, I, I hope. Uh, one is that if the koalas survive, the genome will actually rec begin to actually adapt to these endogenous. Mm -hmm. So just like in the sheep case with the retroviruses, where these endogenous retroviruses now essentially provide the immune system against mm -hmm. sheep 
Yaxt uh, sheep right. retrovirus. You know, I suspect something like this could easily happen in the koala genome, okay. where these remnants now provide the ammunition for the host genome to try to fend off future infections, hmm. and uh, that would be really awesome. The the thing is, we're going to see this happen. I mean, this is going to happen in the next. The resolution is going to happen in the next twenty years. Mm-hmm. I mean, there are populations that mm. you know <laughs> will already be doing this, which yeah. is there are already antibodies, and some people suspect that they might be neutralizing right. uh, already in some of these koala populations. And so, this would be a remarkable sort of thing to see what would happen. So, right now, the living koalas produce retroviruses, and that's how they spread from animal to animal. They're passed in the germ line. That's right. So, the offspring also make viruses. So. If they are beneficial, will they continue to make particles or will only what is required or needed or useful to the host be maintained as an open reading frame? It's a good question. I suspect that they'll only be beneficial as long as the pathogenesis is a challenge. And I suspect yeah. when one yeah. goes away, then the selective pressure to retain the open reading frame will also go away. So in a cyclical way, the infection will come, you'll make these imprints. Yeah. These imprints help you ward off the infection. And then after the infection goes away, the defense goes away also. I see. Okay. So that's, so, so, so that's what we do. This is one of the things that we argued in this yeah. paleovirology article is that just like these fossilized viruses provide this imprint, actually even these fossilized antiviral genes or these defense genes right. can actually provide a really good imprint of what might have happened right. Uh, right even in the absence of the virus itself yeah it's just it's a great reason to study the koalas but it's not easy i understand it's tough to get support yeah and they it. they really do smell i mean i don't know is that right <laughs> yes. yeah, I didn't know that. so um and maybe this is uh, an obvious answer for you but do you think then that there are beneficial viruses for species and not, not all of them are pathogenic uh, I suspect in terms of thinking about autoimmunity, et cetera, I think yeah. it, there could be a benefit to having, you know, given that you've evolved to the state where we have this repertoire mm-hmm. of defense genes, then having some viruses might actually help keep this sort of system tuned. Um, but for the most part, I suspect that when hosts derive some benefit from the virus, it is actually... Mm-hmm often the case that the host can actually simply steal that particular version of that gene. You know, again, coming back to right, and right, that property right. was important for the host yeah. genome. And so it just kept that property rather than kept the... And that, that property improved the host, right? The, the it reproductive could, fitness, exactly. It could, already be, it could already reproduce before, but That's this right. just made it more fit and so it was maintained in the population, right? That's exactly right, yeah. So pieces of viruses. So the, the thing that's curious is that so many of us seem to be infected with these small single-stranded DNA viruses, right? The circo and LO mm-hmm. viruses. And, the, and some of them have endogenized as well, including yeah, in primates. Right. So, so is, that a, <clears throat> is that a benefit to us or is this just a transient period and we're going to just take from them what we need in the long run? I, I, I suspect I suspect it's uh, a little bit of both. I think because just as we would love to survive this Darwinian battle, I suspect the viruses are also competing with each other and mm-hmm. with us for that survival. And so unless we reach a stage where they're sort of co-evolving with the host yeah. genome, I suspect there's always going to be this tension for evolutionary fitness on the host side and the virus side. But no one wants to win, right? The virus doesn't want to wipe out its hosts. It has to have a balance. Because if it kills all the hosts, then it's gone as well. Yeah, so this is a p- perfect example. You know, So are you better off being like Ebola or are you better off yeah. being like herpes simplex virus? You know, which is sort of... Uh, I suspect the answer comes down to demography of the host completely. Yeah. I mean, yeah. and yeah. there's been some modeling done to sort of... Uh, and not by us, but by others suggesting that since the virus is always going to explore mutational space that makes it more virulent, Mm -hmm. and -hmm. because that increased virulence will always give it an advantage over its cousins that are, you know, perhaps less virulent, it's always actually exploring that. But if the the host demography is such that those hypervirulent strains will sort of extinguish themselves because they've killed their Mm -hmm. host, Mm -hmm. then you sort of are mostly at this state where you're kind of at a, you know, yeah, yeah. well-behaved state of uh, pathogenesis, but uh, but if you actually have ample opportunities to transmit yourself right. to new hosts, then then actually virulence is what you would select for. So, but the other way to look at it is it depends on the who is the natural adapted 
host, right? So herpes and humans are adapted millions of years. That's right. We've learned to live with each other, and we coexist well. Herpes is not going to wipe us out. See, but I I suspect, I I completely agree with that. I think that co-evolutionary period is very important, whereas zoonosis is a much more challenging thing. But I also think that even in the herpes case, it's important that it's a negotiated truce in the sense that if you have Mm -hmm. any kind of immunocompromised individuals, right? I mean, you're assuming that your entire repertoire of defense genes is active because if they're not, you're now sort of, you know, herpes viruses can cause severe pathogenesis and yeah. immunocompromised well, patients. I and that, so, I think that even in the zoonotic infections where you have severe disease, I think a lot of those individuals probably have some polymorphisms that compromise their immune response. Their initial, that's I'll right. Bet if we looked at them, you know, we'd find mutations. But, you know, Ebola in its natural host, whatever that may be, some bat, is probably okay. It's evolved with it and it's not hurting it. But then it spills over, and then we get the chap- the title of that book, right, when it comes into people because we encounter them. But we've been doing that all the time because people always lived there and encountered bats, and they died, but no one knew what it was. That's exactly um, right. We've been on the edges of this sort of— Always. Yeah. I mean, spillover is not a new phenomenon, I'm sure. You know, when we were hunting in Africa with spears or whatever, we encountered— Infections, but no one was there to document it or say that it was Ebola. And it's possible right. entire villages went extinct, but you know that sure. was the pocket, and then the virus got extinguished because yeah. that was it. You know that was the host population. But we are now in a very different world where, you know, infections can transmit themselves from re- remote yeah. locations yeah. to you know cosmopolitan centers very quickly. Right. So. Yes. so viruses have big pools of people. So I would guess that if Ebola adapted the ability to transmit well, which it hasn't, yeah. Um, it would probably become less lethal, you know. It would evolve. I don't know why, though. It just it makes sense, but that's not good enough in in science, as you know. I suspect that it would uh, the bulk of the population would evolve, but I suspect that just like in any wild population, there'd be like a distribution of virulence and yeah. transmissibility, yeah. and then we'd always have these flares of highly infectious or hypervirulent. Uh, but take know. flu, right? So it's a well adapted. All the human strains are well adapted after some time, but there are always people who get serious flu. And we think those are people that have mutations in ISGs, for example. That's right, right? yeah. And so maybe that's really it. It, I mean, there are probably viral contributions as well, but I think over long periods those get um, evened out, and then it's really a host mutation that makes the difference. We have to look more at the host, I think. I think that's why. I mean, all these people that die of H5N1, I bet they have predisposing mutations. That'd be interesting. I also suspect that some of it actually comes down to physical stochasticity, you know, sure. how deep yeah. the infection was in the lungs, you know, because the shallow infections probably got cleared right. faster than the, you know, the mucosal deep lung infections. No, and, I think you're right. How much you know, virus this is in SARS that turned out to be the main sort of sure. determinant of sure. fatalities was uh, how deep the infection had yeah. gotten. And um, I also wanted to ask you about... Um, so the the idea of um, looking at conflicts by looking at a virus and a host gene, right? So you've done it mainly using defense proteins in the host and viral proteins that antagonize those. So that was apobec vif. You've done the trim, sam hd one and trim five right. alpha. Yeah, pkr is also another PKR, one. pkr yeah. right? <clears throat> of course, the accordion story. But can you do it with? Just cell proteins that the virus needs. Yes, I think so. And in fact, the best example could be these receptors that the virus yeah. need for entry, which are, you know, yeah. doing a bona fide role in the cell that have nothing to do with the viral entry. But yeah. the viral entry is always pushing this. Actually, Sarah has yeah, this uh, very nice work yes. with the uh, transferrin uh, receptors, and which amazingly are used by multiple different viral lineages. Almost yeah. it's like the you know, like it's CCR5, you know, this, this mutation in CCR5 was not selected for by HIV, but clearly was selected for at some point, we think. Um, what, do you th- what do you think selected that, by the way? I, I'm not sure. Actually, so there's a debate whether it was even selected for. So uh, Pardis Sabedi and Monty Slatkin have this uh, okay. uh, sort of more theory paper arguing that it need not have been selection. Okay. That actually uh, sort of invoked that. My own bias is that it was selection and, and it probably could have been uh, the, the plague uh, mm-hmm. bacterium that actually caused that. Uh, because clearly in the lab, the CCR5 co-receptor is an important receptor for, for bacterial infection. Um, but what's remarkable is that it's actually, if, if 
if a particular protein in the in the host cell had the attention of a particular virus at one mm-hmm. point in history we would never see that but the interesting thing is that multiple completely independent viral lineages have all mm-hmm. converged on the same sort of achilles heel if you will in the host cell to do the the same thing yeah, and that's yeah. why we have this very very obvious signatures even when we are averaging over millions of years mm-hmm. that we can actually see that okay there's been a lot of attention being paid here to this particular surface of the cell and that doesn't make sense from the housekeeping property of that protein mm-hmm. so uh, uh, let's say a a, D- a cellular dna polymerase that the, that a particular virus used there you might not see conflict right well we might see DNA. conflict but that's exactly right so if there's no discrimination so a perfect example is even in pkr which is protein kinase r mm. it needs to recognize double stranded rna to mm. activate itself as a kinase but the rna binding motif has no structural discrimination and so within those motifs we see yeah. no positive selection but surrounding those you know and everything accessory to that we see lots of positive selection okay. so well what if um, a viral protein needed to associate with the cellular DNA polymerase, then that could involve conflict because the cell could the cell that changed to avoid that would survive, right? That's exactly right. If yeah. you could retain housekeeping activity yeah, that allowed yeah. you to survive. So in some cases, like if you're a histone gene and you know histones can be exploited by mm-hmm. uh, things as well, you might not have that luxury in the right. sense you just have, this is the perfect yeah. location for the virus to, you know, so influenza has this histone right. mimic, yeah. as you know, this is discovered, this sort of this property of mimicking a histone. And that might be yeah. sort of checkmate in a sense that you cannot, there is no adaptive landscape because mm. mutation in the histone genes would not sort of evolve. Right. Um, I personally believe that there are still outcomes that could allow you to sort of subvert that by making decoy yeah. proteins, etc. Uh, but I do think that this imp- this is an important thing to think about, which is we tend to think about these cellular proteins, including the proteins that I study in centromeres or cell cycle proteins as perfectly being optimized by evolution. Mm-hmm. Uh, whereas I really think we need to be thinking about them as the best compromise solutions that were able to retain some housekeeping activity that mm-hmm. allowed them to survive, but were actually really selected for because of this sort of ability sure. to escape the viral antagonism. And we, we see this, if you now put that mindset, you know, the dangerous thing is then you see conflict everywhere, but it really allows you to uh, ask questions about, so why are cyclins or mm-hmm. apoptosis proteins so rapidly evolving? And, and then you say, well, there's pathogens that take advantage of these proteins and even encode their own versions right, of these proteins. Right. So. so let me ask you uh, a more selfish question so we have we work on polio and we know its receptor and we know where the virus binds so how could we go about asking whether there has been conflict between the receptor which is a cellular gene and and other viruses over time i think the the, it's very simple i mean Mm -hmm. there's probably enough sequence information that you could just compare the nucleotide sequences Mm -hmm. of the receptor from primate genomes And then uh, there's, there's algorithms, there's beautiful programs which mm-hmm. don't require a lot of work. Uh, one which I'm particularly fond of is this hi-fi suite of programs. That's, uh, it's all sort of computer interface, so you don't even mm-hmm. have to write code to do mm-hmm. anything. Um, and what that will spit out for you is a probability matrix of these are the proteins mm. uh, that we suspect are under positive selection, and these are the residues right. that we suspect are under positive selection. It will give you sort of probability estimates. Um, now, the unfortunate thing is that a lot of people stop there. They mm-hmm. just report that. But what would be much nicer is for people to now make mutations right. in those to show that now this does actually have yeah, an yeah. impact of the yeah. extant viruses. And then because you have two pieces of evidence, evidence that this particular residue changed a lot over the course of evolution and changes, individual changes that these mm-hmm. residues can actually directly impact entry, you can then make the case that these viruses were in fact uh, something like these viruses or something that actually interacted with this surface mm-hmm. actually drove this uh, rapid evolution. So if I found a mutation in the in the receptor binding site in an old species, an ancient species, right, which is still around today, obviously, because that's how we get the sequence. And we found that if you introduce that into, well, what would you do? You would take the sequence of that receptor 
uh, and express it in a cell and see if the virus binds to it or not? Well, you could do it in stages. Uh, so mm-hmm. it, it wouldn't have to be just one because that would not give you a signature. What 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 would give you a signature of positive mm-hmm. selection if you had multiple changes, but they were concentrated in this particular residue okay. or, or okay. set of residues. Okay. And so you could actually start by simply taking, let's say, a rhesus version of the protein yeah. and doing your polio infection assays in there. You know, So all you're asking for is, does cell entry happen? Because after it enters, polio probably has to still negotiate sure. with a bunch of other yeah. things. You do an assay for entry or even just binding if you want. Or, or just you binding. And so then that, you yeah. just say, okay, rhesus human old you know baboons and marmosets this is the binding property so let's say i find that mar- baboon has the poorest mm-hmm. binding and and perhaps thinking about it from the host perspective has the best escape of polio right, right. then you would ask okay can i now what are the residues can i introduce from the baboon backbone into the human backbone mm-hmm. and confer that property and if you can confer that property completely by just bringing in the positively selected changes, then you've actually formally kind of made the case that this positive selection was likely driven by this escape. So that tells you that there could have been a poliovirus-like virus circulating at the time, which exerted the selection. Right, something that was recognizing that interface. It need not have been the same clade of viruses, yeah. So you could do this with any any virus, That's right, yes. Can you do it with bacteria? I, I suspect we can do it much um, much better, actually, with bacteria, uh-huh. partly because with viruses, the unsatisfying thing is that we're not actually able to do too much in terms of changing the viral proteins. Right. With bacteria, we are able to do that in the sense that there are multiple bacterial versions sure. that are closely related evolutionarily that we can actually do sort of this uh, cross. Uh, uh, viruses have a much more... Uh, I mean, I just like viruses, which is why we <laughs> so, sort of study them. But also they have a the uh, functional divergence that's required or imposed by a particular virus infection is often very severe. And so the signatures mm-hmm. of positive selection are often much starker. Mm-hmm. And so I, I don't know what the signatures might look like if you did a yeah. head-to-head comparison with a bacterial antagonist. Now, in bacteria, you could look at it two ways. You could say you could do viruses of bacteria and look for conflicts that's, that's right that's yeah. just using an extension so i'm not sure if you learn anything new but you never know right the other is to say some bacteria need to grow intracellularly right and they need cell proteins so maybe then you could if you know which bacterial and cell proteins interact then you could do the same kind of analysis that's right? exactly right yeah. but a, a, a bacteria just dividing in broth you can't do this kind of Con- well, I guess you can look in the genome itself for conflicts, right? Which I suppose there are because they're mobile elements. That's right. right. Yeah, yeah, but ideally you'd like to recreate the conditions in I which see. that conflict was meaningful. Yeah. So, for instance, you could study listeria, uh, mm-hmm. but right. you know, if you want to study whether it has an effect on the actin machinery by virtue of its, right. it right. probably would only make sense to do it in the context of a you know these. Yeah. Comet tail yeah. acids. Okay. Yeah. So by the same extension, you could do it with intracellular parasites. Absolutely. So right. plasmodium, toxoplasma, right. these are all bona fide candidates. Does anyone do that? Or? Uh, plasmodium is really difficult, and that's yeah. for a completely yeah. sort of technical reason. But people are doing that. The reason it's a difficult thing is because it's such an 80 rich genome yeah. that the synonymous changes saturate very quickly. What I mean by that is your ability to... Yeah correctly infer what a synonymous rate is, is very limited in evolutionary time. And so unless the positive selection happened very recently, you don't have too much ability to actually infer that. Mm. Um, but uh, but certainly, I mean, that's a very good possibility. You recently uh, published a paper looking at AIM-2, which is a component of the DNA sensing apparatus in cells. That's right. And you yeah. concluded that it was subject to positive selection but you didn't know what selected it, right? Yeah, so we we actually didn't conclude it was under positive no. selection so much as the fact that... So this was actually, uh, with a disclaimer, is this is all work done in Dan Stetson's lab, okay. who studies these AIM-2-like <laughs> receptors. The, the reason we got interested in this is because it's been very controversial as to what the DNA sensor is. I mean, people exactly. have published 
strong uh, and strongly worded papers about it's this sensor and not this sensor. And when we uh, and and uh, Dan had this amazing graduate student uh, Rebecca who uh, sort of took the entire panel of the mouse AIM2 like receptors and showed mm-hmm. that. It's extremely heterogeneous. So some of them target the inflammasome pathway that you know Kate Fitzgerald's lab uh, mm-hmm. discovered. Some of them do the sting activated, which is our traditional interferon yeah. you know activation. Right. But in our evolutionary analysis, we realized we were not even calling apples to apples. Like what people were calling IFI sixteen in the mouse genome. Right. There, there was no evolutionary rationale to yeah, call it IFI sure. 16, and so we, we, and we, and this was not their fault. What we pointed out was there had been so much turnover. So it's a different type of innovation. Uh, you know, you could argue it's under positive selection. We haven't looked at that actually, to be honest. But the innovation that was much more obvious was that this gene turnover. It's almost like this accordion mm-hmm. is playing on, mm-hmm. but is now playing on at the level of these DNA sensors, and to the point where AIM2 is the only one that you can convincingly say is in fact an apple to apple comparison yes, everything right. else has changed okay, completely got it. yeah you say that there is a huge diversity of uh, of these proteins right um the, we these findings uh where is it revealing a mark remarkable diversification of these receptors among mammals the alrs the uh um, aim to like receptor gene family. Yeah. So what I was thinking of is if you show, I was looking for an example of where you di- demonstrate positive selection, but you don't know what's doing it. Can you? Yeah. So you I'm going to talk out? about one example That's what you're doing tomorrow. Uh, tomorrow okay. Yeah. Where we have strong suspicions, but you know, we actually have multiple genes like that. We have multiple yeah. ISGs that have positive selection. Not all of them are positively selected, but some of them have so much positive selection that you could bet money that there is going to be an antagonism. And in fact, not only that, it's going to be a direct antagonism because that interface is actually directly bound by some virus or some bacteria. And if the ISG is very broadly acting, like Mm. let's say MX or, you know, Viperin or something, it's going to be really difficult to pin down what is that viral antagonist. But let's say it's a very specific anti-retroviral gene, mm-hmm. then at least your world of candidates you know, comes down. But yeah, that's where yeah. the hard part begins, which is can you use the signature of positive selection to actually even infer what the antagonism the, is? And actually, that's what Matt Doherty in the lab is say, actually... I remember doing. he had yeah. said that he was looking for... And he figured he thought it was a particular virus. Yeah, so we think in this case, it's a pox virus. Pox virus yeah. yeah. So that's what you're talking about. That's right, yeah. So that'll be published briefly. sometime in the future, right? That's right. Well, as as I as I point out to people interviewing in my lab, we publish well, but we don't publish quickly. So okay. hopefully, it'll be published soon. But. Um, I have an e- actually an email for you. I'm going to read to you, which which is right up your alley. Uh, but first, I want to I'm going to tell everyone I'm going to put a link to this really cool YouTube video of you. Have you seen this? No. It was made by the Hutch. You must have. Because you oh, know, this is the, the... It's a promotional the, kind of video. The basic... Yeah. Yeah. The, it's really well done. Yes. It it's was very artistic. A, and it's it's uh, unusual that someone with creativity uh, did it because they have you fading in and out and moving all over the place. It's really good. I like it. So this is an email from Charles who writes... You're going to love this. During episode 198, you talked about the eternal competition between viruses and their hosts, the so-called Red Queen's race. It occurred to me that the character of the race must have changed when animals evolved sufficient intelligence to know how to avoid sick and therefore infectious neighbors. Would this have put selective pressure on viruses to either not produce visible symptoms of disease or take a long time about it in order to provide a window in which their host could infect others? So uh, there's more, but... That's a that. that's a great question, actually. <laughs> so, almost certainly, there must have been some selection. So, we I, I can't speak for viruses, but parasites certainly do crazy things to their hosts. I mean, we know sure. of uh, toxoplasma that makes mice, you know, seek out uh, you know riskier yeah. pleasures that they would not otherwise do. And I think, in the perspective of uh, what the virus or, or the parasite might do, it's all about transmission and finishing its life cycle. So, if visible scars were an impediment to future reproduction for the virus, my prediction would be absolutely yeah, that yeah. that would delay it. On, on the other hand, if the, you know, if pox viral pustules are the only way that the virus can transmit, then it's yeah, sort of stuck with stuck. the... Uh, yeah. yeah, viruses don't. He, he writes, 
would know to avoid. It's not really knowing. It's just an evolution. It's just it's exp- you know it's exploring Darwinian yeah, space and what right. some of these will survive better. By the way, we we talked about a parasite on my other podcast a while ago. This is a worm that infects crickets and it makes them jump in the water. Normally, crickets stay away from the water. I've seen this uh, and video. Then, then the cr- the worm ends up in the water, which is where it wants to be yes. to reproduce. It's Actually, it even. Almost completely extricates itself from the yeah. the I guess the carcass of the cricket. Yeah, the so the trout or the fish then usually eat the, eat it. the cricket, and the worm comes out the gills or even goes through the intestinal tract, and it's fine. And the the fish get food, and the cricket is you know. <laughs> Actually, it makes me think about baculoviruses because baculoviruses do something very similar to gypsy moth larvae, where they are sort of they force them to seek that. The, the tops the tree. of trees and then yeah. get you know eaten and then they burst transfer. open and they spray virus down. exactly yeah, so the, the maximum leaves. transmission it goes so. on the leaves and then more caterpillars eat them yeah, yeah. so so we we don't know of any viruses that make your you more aesthetically pleasing <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> but yeah right but uh, certainly things that end up being very unappetizing yeah uh, so he continues, for humanity, a much more important change to the nature of the race must have happened in the last 200 years. Our increasing intelligence has got us to the point where, unique among all the species on this planet, we are actually aware of viruses' existence and use our intelligence to develop treatments against them. From this perspective, it might not be too much of an exaggeration to regard virologists as an evolved response to the problem of viruses. We must hope that viruses don't retaliate by selectively targeting virologists. They couldn't do that. I think they would mean, if there were genetic discrimination possible, you could imagine they could do that. But uh, there's just no way to discriminate from a virus's perspective. Yeah. Although I, I really like that line. Perhaps I can use it in my next yeah, NIH sure. application. Of course. More seriously, given the extra effort that humans are making to defeat viruses that infect us and those species dear to us, are there any signs that these viruses are now evolving faster than viruses that aren't in our sites? It's an ascertainment bias problem. It's entirely possible that that is true, but we, since we know so little about... So we know a lot about viruses that make people sick. Mm. We know a little bit less about viruses that make livestock sick. Uh, but yeah. we know far less, for instance, about viruses that make rodents or even you know other mammals sick, unless they're sort sure. of zoo yeah. animals. I, I I suspect because of virus discovery programs, we are we are actually correcting that a little bit because we are able to go to exotic locations and uh, exotic animals and sort of identify more of these viruses. What that doesn't tell you though is like what is the pathogenicity scale of this virus? You know, is this yeah. really making or you, you collect 500 viral uh, types from a particular organism, it doesn't necessarily tell you that it's making the organism sick or which one is making it sick. So, But but the viral discovery thing is, I'm really hopeful about. I mean, so, some work from Ian Lipkin's lab, but also Joe DeRisi's lab with these snake uh, mm. arena virus. I mean, that, that's a remarkable story where you can solve an epidemiological problem uh, and you know, implicate very clearly uh, a virus that uh, that's at the heart of that. And so uh, based on those very sort of sp- spotty examples of discovery, I would argue that there is not a slowing down or acceleration. Yeah, I, w- I agree with you, but you're the expert. Um, I suspect we can't make a dent unless we really um, mess things up here, which we will <laughs> eventually. One sobering reminder, actually, from the virology perspective is we have some really good sort of almost like magic bullets. You know, you could argue ribavirin mm. for a rapidly evolving virus. Mm. That's a really good uh, sort yeah. of thing. But but thinking from an evolutionary standpoint, I mean, you could sort of select for more high fidelity viruses, right? Like as yeah. Raul Andino and sure. Carla Kierkegaard have shown. So it just just argues that it's not that you know, it gives us, it is a red queen in the sense that we have this temporary sort of solace that we get from these, you know, the flu vaccine gives us some solace and the, yeah, you know, yeah. these therapies, but this is an ongoing dynamic system. Sure. And as long as the viruses have the ability to evolve, we have to expect that some evolution is going to yield failure of our therapies. The thing is that we are, we're only looking at a small piece of time when we're here, right? And we've only had good technical abilities in the last 20 years. So we, we, before that, we really didn't know what was going on. But going forward, if we're around for another 100 or 200 years, it could be very interesting. 
we can really figure out things that are going on that we had never any clue of before. I think that's pretty exciting. It's also sort of, we have this perspective, which is very human centric. So sure. we discovered a lot of antibiotic resistance in bacteria. And then we went through this phase so phase where we were like, oh my God, we're using too many antibiotics. And that's certainly true and creating resistance. But more recent work has actually shown that actually the antibiotics we use yeah. There are actually things that the bacteria actually encounter. And sure. and, and perhaps <laughs> the, the resistance of the antibodies far preceded yeah. the actual massive use or overuse of, of the antibiotics. Course. That still doesn't mean we should overuse these antibiotics. But it also says that our uh, framing of putting ourselves in this problem is perhaps misleading. Mm. I mean, this, this conflict or this... Uh, adaptation far preceded perhaps even the invention of sure. or yeah. discovery of antibiotics by humans. Uh, please keep up the great work with all your podcasts. I now listen to TWIV, TWIM, and TWIP, even though I've had to increase the number of times a week I go to the gym to find time to listen to them all. Yours ever gratefully, Charles. Charles is from the UK. Well, at least we get people healthier, right? They go work out and listen. <laughs> That's true. Um, I want to wrap this up with a pick of the week. Because um, I found this yesterday, <clears throat> and since we have an election in this country in a couple of weeks, a presidential election among others, I think this is a really important thing for uh, everyone to look at. This is at a website, let's see, it's called um, Science Debate, sciencedebate.org. And the article is, um, well, basically they put uh, a bunch of questions to both Obama and Romney science questions, and they asked for their responses. So you get uh, all of these questions, and I think there are 14 of them. One of them is vaccination and public health. You know, should we let people be exempt? Um, natural resources, global warming, ocean health, things like that, the Internet. So they have both of their answers. You can see them side by side. I think everybody who's going to vote, or who may not vote even, may, should really look at this, because the two candidates, as you might uh, imagine, have uh, quite different answers. So, again, that's sciencedebate.org slash debate12. Actually, this, this, is a, uh, this site is a partner with Scientific American, so I was actually reading Scientific American, and I discovered this. So you should really check that out, because, as I said... Um, a uh, important elections coming up. I also have a listener pick of the week. This is from Steve, who writes, saw this mural of the Henrietta Lacks story painted by middle school students while on a walk in Oak Park, Illinois. Thought it might be of interest. So this is a beautiful mural. He took a panoramic photograph of it. Um, it's got DNA and it's got That's cells amazing. and it's got HeLa. And the kids clearly made it. It's really Is beautiful. Is it middle school students? Middle right? school students, that's yeah. amazing. So he found that. So that's cool. And I really appreciate that, um, um, Steve. And so we'll put that in our listener pick so everybody should take a look at that. And that is TWIV205. You can find it just like all the others on iTunes at the Zoom Marketplace and at TWIV.TV. And don't forget to visit our Facebook fan page, facebook.com slash This Week in Virology. And as usual, we love to get your questions and comments. Send them to twiv at twiv.tv. Harmid Malik is at the, what we call affectionately, the hutch. Thanks so much for doing this today. I really it's had a good pleasure. time. Hope you enjoyed yeah. it. I, I did. I like, uh, you know, I love Twiv and all the other co-hosts, but sometimes I like going one-on-one -on -one and having like a little talk show and uh, i think we had a good time today i really enjoyed it so i really appreciate it and uh look forward to your talk tomorrow i'm vincent racaniello and you can find me at virology.ws you've been listening to this week in virology thanks for joining us we'll be back next week another twiv is viral